Hi, welcome to the presentation of the paper Masking Kuiper First and Higher Order Presentation. I am Marc Gorgeon, and this is a joint work with Joppe Boss, Tobias Schneider, Joost Reins, and Christine van Weyden. In our work, we applied the masking countermeasure to the post quantum crypto scheme Kyber. Kyber is one of the finalists in the ongoing NIST competition and might be selected as one of the standard post quantum crypto schemes. Um, for the next few decades, so it might make sense to have a look whether we can mask it and protect it against side channel attacks. In doing so, we have not only masked the full post quantum scheme, but we, other, we also had to come up with two, two new algorithms to mask the algorithms used in Kyber for the compression and the comparison. In the following, I'm going to detail how we had to how we masked Kyber and why we actually did it, um, as well as go into our evaluation details uh, a bit. And one slide recap on side channel attacks. Um, side channel attacks work by exploiting physical effect. That is, if we look at this processor here to the right hand side, then when this processor performs a computation, for example, here adding the sensitive key K. Um, with a plain text P, then this processor will actually draw a power consumption or a level, a amount of power which depends on the data used in this instruction step, so on the values actually um, summed up here. And by placing some measurement gear, an adversary might learn this data-dependent power consumption and infer back information on, uh, on sensitive data. Now, masking is a countermeasure against this. And for a sensitive value x, it performs, um, it splits the, the, this value x into multiple shares here, x0, x1, uh, up to xn. And there are different forms of sharings, which is relevant for, for post quantum sc crypto schemes. Here, the sum over all the shares using Boolean XOR is equivalent to the original sensitive value x. But there are other kinds of sharings because this one here on the upper row allows to perform Boolean op operations on these masked values um, quite easily. Instead, if we wanted to perform arithmetic computations with our shared value, an arithmetic sharing would be much more helpful, um, which uses the arithmetic addition of a shares in a certain ring with a certain modulus. That is here, the addition of shares is equivalent to the sensitive value x. And for, for the post-quantum crypto scheme Kyber, it is quite relevant to notice that here we can use, we have the choice to use a modulus, which is uh, power to k two, or to use a prime modulus as we are actually required to use it in Kyber. In general, side channel attacks exploit, might exploit multiple measurement samples, up to t measurement samples, and then this is a teeth order side channel attack. And to protect against a teeth order side channel attack, we also need to perform higher order masking, which is why we actually masked our post quantum crypto scheme not only at first order, but also generic in the order at higher orders. A few facts about Kyber. Kyber is a key encapsulation mechanism which is based on the module learning with errors problem and it uses the prime modulus. As we're going to see, this is causing a few headaches. It has three primitive operations. Um, the key generation, which will produce on every invocation a secret key, which, um, and, and since this is usually susceptible to single trace attacks, masking is not really the right countermeasure to protect against this. Then we have the encapsulation, which will encapsulate a secret message M um, using the public key, and then only the party which owns the corresponding secret key is able to dec decapsulate using the decapsulation operation this um, uh, secret message M. And M is then by both parties used to derive a common session key, but this one is ephemeral, and we usually don't want to protect ephemeral secrets um, using masking. This decapsulation, as I already said, is using the long-term secret key. Um, and therefore, we need to protect this long-term secret key using the masking countermeasure. Furthermore, the decapsulation is secure against chosen ciphertext cipher attacks by using the Fujisaki Okamoto transform. And again, this is also going to give a bit of difficulty. Let's quickly look a bit more detail at a, with a bit more detail into the decapsulation. 
Um, the decapsulation has on the left hand side as input the ciphertext D, which contains the message M, or is an encapsulation of the message M, and on the right hand side will produce a shared ephemeral session key K. And then it works by performing first the decryption using the secret key S and producing uh, the original message M prime. Um, and now the chosen ciphertext, the resilience against so chosen ciphertext text works by re-encrypting this message M prime using the fully deterministic encapsulation um, uh, procedure again, uh, encryption procedure. And this will lead then using the public key and this will uh, result in a ciphertext C prime which has to be compared here in this stage to the original ciphertext C. And only if this, these two ciphertexts are equivalent then or equal, then the key derivation will actually use secret key dependent material key prime, the output of a hash function here in the block G. Um, and if they are not equivalent, then a random number, random static number will be used. All the blocks marked in color need to be masked to some degree. The special case here is the K prime, which we don't need to mask or which we are able to unmask um, the moment where we know that the ciphertext matches. Match. Um, so C prime is equivalent to C. And also the output of this comparison here doesn't need to be masked, um, but only the very output, no, no intermediate of this comparison. So we can uh, unfold the blocks and look a bit more in close uh, in detail. Um, here on the left hand side we have again the ciphertext which is decompressed and will result in two polynomials where you uh, the bold ones are actually um, uh, vectors of polynomials, um, multiple polynomials and every coefficient of these polynomials is in the range 0 to q minus 1. And then there are some operations performed which involve the long-term secret key and therefore these blocks here need to be masked. Then at this point here we perform a uh, compression um, which will um, turn a coefficient which is in 0 to q minus 1 into a message bit which is 0 or 1. Um, then here we have the re-encryption which uses the output of a masked hash. Um, this is a SHA-3. And um, uh, then a lot of operations are performed which result in two polynomials again, or here a vector of polynomials and here a polynomial, which will usually be compressed into a ciphertext again and then compared with the ciphertext C prime and then compared to the original ciphertext. But in our case, we come up with a new algorithm which avoids the compression and performs the comparison based on the coefficients here um, of the polynomials without performing the compression. I will now go into detail. So for most of these blocks, we have um, solutions available, but not for the compressed Q and not for the decompressed comparison. Um, so for the PRF, there's prior work, so the pseudorandom functions, there's prior work, and for the centered binomial sampler as well. And the decompression here in this case is actually like from one bit to zero or Q. Um, I think it was like this. So this is a one bit um, Boolean to arithmetic conversion, and there we have also algorithms available. Okay, I will now detail this first green box, the compression of a coefficient into a single bit. And if we look at the equation for this, then this is wonderful to mask um, because we have a coefficient x which is divided by q and then rounded to the next bit. This is awesome since we don't have a mask rounding operation and we don't have a mask division. And therefore, um, this is quite hard to mask or we have to come up with new approaches to mask it. Yes. And in the following we are always going to look at the interval which x the coefficient can take. Usually this is in 0 to q minus 1 here on the right hand side and we can see that this interval is um, sp as equally spaced in, in by, by, by q4 and uh, 3 over 3q over 4. The first approach and this is already in prior work is to shift this interval to make, to construct an interval, two intervals which are equally shaped um, by just adding q over 4 
to the polynomial and coming up with a new shifted compression function um, which decides whether the output of this compression, so this bit, is zero if q is small, if x is smaller than q over two, or is one other way. In other post-quantum crypto schemes, this is already sufficient to, to mask this um, almost, because in Sabre, for example, we have a modulus which is a power to two. And therefore, the most significant bit of this um, variable x will immediately tell whether um, the coefficient falls into the interval which is smaller than q half or the interval which is greater or equal to q half. Unfortunately, we have in Kyber a prime modulus, and that is the most significant bit here is set at an, uh, has a certain offset to q over 2. And that means also that the intervals which are defined um, uh, by the most significant bit have a different shape because the most significant bit is all zero here on the left hand side and all one. Right. And we cannot use the most significant bit approach immediately. <clears throat> okay, so we have a different approach to do this um, for prime Q for arbitrary uh, moduli. And this works actually by looking at the individual bits which make up X. So here I have annotated the bits of X and if we look at this, we can immediately tell that, uh, oh yeah, one thing to observe is that we are op operating mod Q here. That is, there are no um, values in this operation since the coefficient value X has been reduced always before we perform these operations. So we can look at the bits of X and if we see that the 11th bit is that, we immediately know that X must be in this part of the interval here and therefore compress shift Q must be one. On the other hand, we can also look at um, the cases where this bit is specifically not set. Um, and then we can see that if, well, two to the power of uh, the tenth bit, the ninth bit and the eighth bit is set, then we are approximately somewhere here um, in this interval. And then we again know that compress shift Q must be one. And this is a very easy binary search over the bits of X. And when we do this using, for example, here this table-based approach, then we will end up with a formula um, like this, where we actually say like, well, either X11 is uh, the 11th bit is set or um, the bit is not a set and this formula holds true, then compress, Q, uh, compress shift um, Q of X must be set to one. Um, and the great part is now we have transformed our original equation which had um, uh, rounding and division by Q into a formula here which is just composed of Boolean operations, XORs, negations and AND operations. And this is something we can very easily mask because there are lots of algorithm, uh, masked versions of these operations here. Um, so Overall, the algorithm performs, um, is shown here on the right hand side, um, and the, the, the representation here actually uses multiple coefficients, um, that is all the coefficients of a polynomial. Um, and it starts by shifting, as I detailed before, then performing an arith arithmetic to Boolean conversion, that is changing from a sharing, t uh, sharing equation where we had x0, uh, sorry, plus x1 plus x2 and so on, to a setting where we have x0, x or x1. So the sensitive value is composed of the addition of the shares to a setting where the, the Boolean sum of the shares is um, equivalent to the secret we have here in equivalence, right? Okay, so after this aromatic to Boolean conversion, we are able to use the bits of um, our Boolean sharing of our x um, in this equation. So this is the mask representation of the equation I have shown on the slide before. And moreover, since this is a Boolean operation, we can easily bit slice it and perform these operations here on multiple coefficients at once, which speeds up the entire algorithm. In summary, we get a compression to one bit for prime moduli, um, and it only requires a single A to B conversion, which is at higher orders, usually the bottleneck. Furthermore, um, it's higher order probing secure. That is, we can also use it to protect against adversaries, which exploit multiple 
measurement samples. Um, by using the bit slice by Boolean search, we are generic in Q and can apply this to different um, settings. And it's also well suited, not only well suited for single bit compression, but it's also, and we detail how um, applicable to multi bit compression, although it becomes a bit more complex there. Now I'm going to detail our second algorithm, our second new algorithm for the ciphertext comparison. So we can quickly remember that as an output or um, intermediate output of this re-encryption in the decapsulation, there is this vector of polynomials u prime and this polynomial v prime. Usually these are compressed to multiple bits. So I think for the v prime it is compressed to four bits. And for the U prime, depending on the security order of Kyber, security parameter of Kyber, it's compressed to 10 or 11 bits. And this means that our previous approach for the compression um, becomes quite, quite complex. And each of these compressions here are quite, quite heavy if they are masked. Furthermore, there's a comparison. So the result of this is essentially the U part of the ciphertext and the V part of the ciphertext, which together make up the ciphertext C prime. And then this is compared to the C. And this here needs to be protected as well, whereas the output of this it does not need to protect it as uh, anymore. And the detail why is actually in the paper described. Um, yes, so we don't want to mask this because it brings a lot of overhead. And we actually circumvent it by not performing the compression here, these two blocks, and per performing a different kind of comparison here. Instead of performing an equality check of the compressed ciphertext, we rather ask, will the coefficient u prime i belonging to this vector u, um, fall, uh, does it belong to the set of values a coefficient can take, which would compress to the correct ciphertext bits? bits? Um, so here we have, uh, yeah, so this is the set of, of values which compresses to the right ciphertext ci, which would be here, um, which belongs to the input ciphertext. And the important part to notice is that this is public information. We don't need to protect it. It's actually controlled by an session adversary uh, possibly, and it's public, so we can perform arbitrary computations, and that means we can pre-compute the set of values which belongs um, to this, yeah, we can pre-compute the set of values. Um, we do this by having a, a function s and e, which denote the start and the end of the interval for valid coefficients. That is our question now, instead of this whole block, is rather that we have the um, coefficient u, u prime i, and we ask, does it belong to the interval where a valid coefficient corresponding to c i prime is? And then all we need to do is to perform this check. Does it belong to the valid coefficients, um, to the valid range for all the coefficients in u prime and v prime? And if all of them belong to the correct set, um, then we can output true. And if one of them does not belong to the set, we output false. Now, you might have observed that this question is something smaller than the start of the interval. And um, oh, no, sorry, is it larger than the start of the interval and smaller than the end of the interval? Wasn't that straightforward to mask, uh, to perform in a mask manner if we have a prime moduli? Um, but we are quite lucky here because this interval between start and end for a correct ciphertext is quite small for the relevant um, compression um, uh, parameters we have in Kyber. That means that these intervals um, always fit into the range where the most significant bit of Kyber is one. And then we can approach the, the setting to ask whether x is smaller than the end of the interval and whether x is greater than the start of the interval, greater or equal to the start of the interval, by just shifting um, the value of the coefficient accordingly, such that it is in the range, strictly in the range, where the most significant bit is one, and then extract the most significant band in a masked manner to determine whether x is smaller than e and greater or equal to the start of the interval. Yes, um, so uh, this is quite cool because we again have a comparison now um, for prime moduli, which avoids the costly compression stages and is again higher order proving secure. 
Um, unfortunately, we require two A to B conversions, one to check whether it's smaller than the start of the, uh, smaller than the end of the interval, and one A to B conversion to check whether it is larger or equal than the start of the interval. On the other hand, it's again widely applicable for different um, prime modules, um, modules non-prime and prime, and um, and also different compression um, values with some limitations, as I detailed on the slide before. Okay, we implemented all this, also hardened a few implementations, and actually used um, verification technologies to assess that our implementation is correctly hardened using SCVRF. Um, but uh, here I'm going in this talk, I'm going to focus on our benchmark results. So the first question which arises is, are our algorithms actually faster than a generic approach using mask lookup tables? And the answer is yes. So in our paper, we have three different settings and th setting three at first order. Um, our two algorithms are used and we have a masked lookup table for the arithmetic to Boolean conversion and this in total outperforms all the two different approaches um, where one or both of the algorithms are replaced by a generic masked um, lookup table approach. And this is mainly due to the case that the initialization of those lookup tables takes quite a lot of time, whereas here we have just the A to B which needs to be initialized and is shared uh, across a lot of components. Then we can look into the actual um, benchmark results. At first order, we performed the benchmarking on two um, devices, uh, Cortex-M0 Plus and the Cortex-M4, uh, with two reference implementations, um, the PQ-Clean implementation and the PQ-M4. So for Cortex-M0 Plus, we observed a slowdown of uh, factor 2.2, but this excludes the randomness generation and is more or less a comparison between compiler-generated code and compiler-generated code, since there are no, comp no assembly optimizations available for the Cortex-M0+. We can then see that the majority of the impact, the overhead, um, is caused by the um, pseudo-random functions uh, in these uh, get-noise functions um, involved in the re-encryption. For the Cortex and 4, the situation is a bit different. There, we observe a slowdown of factor 3.5, um, where also because we included a true random number generation, but also because the PQM4 implementation we used as an unmarked referent is highly optimized and uses a lot of um, assembly optimizations, for example, for the NTT. Um, again, we are able to see that the majority of the impact is caused by the, um, uh, the, the sampling of the error polynomials and also by the catch -up. Then for higher order, um, we also wanted to have a look and we implemented our scheme again for second and third order implementation, second and third order protection on both devices. And this time there is no lookup table involved and uh, all the A to B conversions are performed using actual algorithms. And we can immediately see that there's a severe impact um, which is happening due to this, due to these A to Bs. We still have the, the sampling, which um, produces a lot of impact on second and third order, but we can also see that the comparison um, is contributing um, a larger overhead with the, depending on the order. Um, which uses the A to B, and this has a very massive uh, randomness consumption and operation um, um, count, um, which comes with these I to Bs, uh, arithmetic to Boolean conversions at higher order. So in total, for second order, we see a speed uh, slowdown of factor 20 or factor 50, and for third order, it's even severe. But we also need to mention here that these implementations have hardly been optimized for second and third order, and there's a lot to gain. Um, so this is more like a, a first result and um, we can from, from here on start uh, more detailed, more focused optimization strategies. There's a lot more to be found in the paper. First we have all our constructions are proven, strong and interferent, um, secure, and we also give complexity estimates. We detail how we mask the CBD which we adopted. Um, why in detail on why this KDF and the output of the comparison don't need to be masked. Um, and we performed uh, extensive physical evaluation in low noise environments with TVLA on a, uh, on a Cortex M0 Plus. And we also used formal verification for implementation to really be sure that it's correctly masked. 
um, uh, which actually involved to come up with new techniques to verify the security of our lookup tables. And we also present the leakage model we use for verification on the Cortex and zero plus um, here. Thanks for your attention and um, please ask uh, any questions during the live session of the chess talk. Thanks a lot.